Alrighty, um, so we're giving a talk on the BeagleBone Black Arduino and electronics, um, doing hardware stuff from a person who is basically a trained software engineer. Um, initially, the inspiration was to sort of get away from Emacs, get away from C, C++, Node.js, all of this sort of stuff, and you know, start putting wires together on the breadboard. It seemed like a, a fun little uh, hobby that could be done. The uh, sort of good news and bad news when you start reading the, well, when I started reading some of the electronics books was that once it got to the advanced electronics, they were saying, now we can do binary logic in ICs. And I sort of thought that's, uh, you know, show me the less advanced electronics. Um, the same sort of thing with a lot of ICs that were accessible over I2C or SPI. Um, with the I2C, you're basically starting to find that you get um, a large register table, for lack of better. And if you can uh, use a library that can talk I2C, then you're basically just prodding registers and you know, reading stuff out of other registers. And you start getting into the fact that you're doing a lot of stuff in software. And for SPI, you're doing chip selects, and then you're having interrupt service routines, and you're having to try and suspend an SPI session that's already happening with another chip so that you can have another interaction with another SPI chip on the bus and then unsuspend things. So it all basically comes down to how you structure your software as to how well things work, um, rather than the, uh, the initial glory of playing around with little wires and, uh, and chips and being a, an electronics engineer. Uh, to put things in perspective, this whole area here could have been done uh, on a microcontroller, but I wanted to do it in hardware. So these, um, this generates interrupts when you roll the trackball, and each of those interrupts comes in here to a 4-bit ripple counter. So you're basically doing um, you know, one, to six, 1 to 16 counters that come out in parallel to a multiplexing chip. And you can then read the values from the ripple counter from the multiplexing chip over I2C. So this was a, an overt attempt to actually do things in hardware rather than do things in software. In software, you would just attach that directly to four different pins on an Arduino and then um, have interrupt service routines on the Arduino and count things up in software. Um, so from the, the glory of selecting microcontrollers, um, Arduino is probably the, the big well-known one that everyone sort of gets, but um, I've played around with the Tiny and the 1284. Uh, one of the other interesting little traps when you start doing the software side of things on these microcontrollers is it's very easy to have gotten used to having a memory management unit in your desktop machine, and these things don't have those. And if you have a, a situation where the 16K or the 2K of RAM is actually over, oversubscribed, the stack comes up from one end and the heap comes down from the other end, and at some random point the two of them will meet, and you know, things that you may not have intended to happen will happen. So if you're getting bizarre behavior, uh, rather than just checking capacitors and things like that and seeing whether or not you're getting voltage drops that are causing brownouts, um, you may want to see whether your heap is actually uh, doing things you didn't want. Um, but even the microcontrollers are getting quite interesting with propeller being the multi-core and the, the launch pad, and there's a whole bunch of others. And likewise, from there, if you go up into the little single board computer arms, where you've got the BeagleBone, the Red Axe, the Droid, Raspberry Pi, the Freescale IMX6, and there's a whole slew of things. Uh, and the difference is sort of that the Arduinos, um, if you're buying them cheap from China, you can sort of buy one for about three bucks. And the ARM machines usually run from like uh, 50 to 100 dollars. And then you get into little laptops and um, Intel ARM machines. So I was sort of got ahead of myself a bit in the comparison that um, yeah, for uh, from a software perspective, some people find it a little disheartening, the fact that you only get 2K of RAM um, and 32K of flash. So it's very easy when you're writing Arduino programs to actually run out of storage for the compiled binary to fit in. And of course, have your heap and stack meet, which um, you start running into the fact that the 328 is actually a microcontroller and is designed to do a, a small amount of stuff. So the talk overview I have, um, instead of just doing, you know, this is a spy API on and on um, Arduino, and this is how you do it from Node.js and sort of really quite boring and dry slides. Um, I've taken some projects that I've done, including Terry, and I have close-up shots of Terry and then parts of the code that actually run uh, behind it and where, where they are and things that are potentially more interesting. And also, um, from the perspective of this, which is going to be version 2 with the motherboard, um, I don't know where I'm feeding back. But I have this, which is a Arduino-based thing. Um, so it's basically the smallest, cheapest uh, robot that I could make, uh, which took about 24 hours to make. 
And the difference is that this has no real feedback and has absolutely no perception of the world, which we'll get into once the Terry slides come up. So robot arm control, um, five servos. Uh, the green board's a serial servo motor controller, uh, which can control 32 servos and also doles out the power to the servos. Uh, the code to actually do this from the BeagleBone Black. Um, basically, these lines will set up the BeagleBone Black as four and a half UARTs. So you get, I think, two spy channels, two I2C, four and a half UARTs, and a whole bunch of GPIOs. Um, I definitely recommend the BeagleBone Blackboard if you're looking to do um, things that a one meg ARM chip is capable of doing. If, you, if your, your application is going to fit in a gig of RAM, I think it's a gig or 512 meg, in a reasonably low amount of RAM and a one gig ARM chip and you want a hell of a lot of I.O. and you actually are looking more to write your code in JavaScript or Node.js, BoneScript, um, it's a great platform. So once you create your serial port, um, what was I doing here? Ah oh, yes, um, because it's a serial API basically telling uh, motors what, all, all of the five motors on the arm, what position you'd like them to be in. This is, I was really expecting to have the slides on my screen as well, so this walking backwards and forwards is, wasn't planned. Uh, one of the things that I found when, you were doing the, when I was doing this controlling the arm was that um, Node.js is a, obviously an asynchronous model right from sort of ground up. Um, there are some calls which they have like the sync in the API so that you, you get the traditional sort of call it and wait and then move on. But if you're trying to interact with something over UART, the thing on the other end of the UART is very much expecting you know, serial commands and waiting for the completion of the commands before it goes to the next command. So if you tell the arm, you know, move here, move here, move here, it'll receive those three serial commands you know, pretty much instantly back to back, and the arm will sort of you know, go straight to the third position, basically. So you have to structure your, your code at times if you're interacting with a, um, a serial uh, protocol to actually create a queue and uh, the good part about this is that with JavaScript, you can basically have a push and wait function, which pushes the two commands onto the queue, and then you can basically just keep telling the arm move here, move to these five locations, but make sure you complete before you do that, <coughs> or place timers in there. So you can get a API that allows asynchronous execution on the controlling board, but will actually have a, a serial um, outcome electrically when you're actually talking to the robot arm. Uh, from there, Node.js obviously makes it incredibly easy to make a web interface, uh, which in this case, I, th I was basically just using uh, jQuery, I'm not sure, probably everyone here is sort of fairly okay with making web interfaces with jQuery and all of this sort of thing. But being able to make the web server in a few lines, instead of, again, with Arduino, where you want to actually have a web interface, but then you need to buy um, either an add-on or you need to pay quite a lot to get a, um, a slow ethernet connection on there. So it's a different controller for a different uh, application. And the front end basically just attaching stuff with jQuery, using WebSockets to talk to the BeagleBone and actually have the uh, BeagleBone react to buttons and things like that that you've created on the interface. Um, on the BeagleBone Black, if you actually want stuff, because this large robot you see at the very uh, top front, it's got a BeagleBone Black which is sitting here with the, the bunch of wires coming out of it, which is what controls the whole show. And you can create, it has the Cloud9 server on there, and you can tell it to run um, BoneScript or Node.js on boot. So it automatically starts that, and you can have all of your HTML and JavaScript files able to be delivered as well. So you basically switch it on, and the machine boots up, and starts controlling your hardware, and starts offering you the, the web interface to interact with that which is pretty much what this is. You're having the uh, sliders, the six slider to set the speed at which you want servos to operate at and the five, sli five sliders to control each of the individual servos on a robot arm. So moving on to the, the smaller robot that I've just sort of held up. Um, the design of the small robot, I put this up on Hackaday. Um, so it was sort of an interesting, you know, everyone likes to build a small Arduino-based robot, but very few people like to actually say how, how they did it or open source the code to do it. So you have the uh, Arduino 328, uh, the two motors at the bottom, one of the RF24 radio chips, and in the middle a um, H-bridge chip or a dual H-bridge chip to actually control the, the two motors. 
So it's probably a design that everyone's done um, who's made a little too well differential drive robot. Um, and the gear motor drivers, if you're interacting with those from a, a software point of view, a lot of the, again, a lot of the hardware, like you wind up buying one of these chips, which is two or five bucks from China, or one of these, which is 10 bucks, and uh, the H bridges, et cetera, are sort of, they're there, and you obviously know that the hardware's there, but then you sort of get relegated to being software again, and in this case, you have two IO pins, and if they're high or low, it changes which way the motor's gonna rotate. And then one other pin where you send out a pulse width modulated signal to actually control how quickly the power is turned on and off and how quickly the wheels are gonna rotate in the direction you've chosen. So a lot of it comes down to fairly rudimentary software coding, um, even though you're sort of playing around with motors and all of this sort of thing. Um, one thing that I found, I found a few interesting traps. A lot of this, it seems very interesting and you say, oh, you know, putting together a little robot with a radio interface and a joystick control should be fairly simple, but then as soon as you do it, you find that it's, there are uh, traps that are, are waiting to be found. So in this case, you set up a couple of arbitrary addresses and you have a, a binary sort of structure that you're going to send through for where the actual joystick is being held. And unless you put in this line here, it seems you're basically just doing a radio write of, you know, give me the buttons, give me where the joystick is being held and just keep doing it every 20 milliseconds or something like that and sending it over to the, the robot. But unless you flick it between uh, writing and starting to listen on the radio, you don't get anything because every packet you send on the RF24 is actually acknowledged again back. So unless the actual controller board is waiting for the acknowledgement packet, then it can never actually come back, so it can never actually send a second packet. Which is one of those things that I like about doing this, you know, because you find all of these little traps by, by trying to actually get things to run. And the RF24 on the other side is perhaps not as basically just grabs the packets and controls the two motors. So this Terry 2.0 is what you see here. Um, it's still controlled by the BeagleBone Black at the top. I've inserted a uh, J1900 uh, quad core Atom chip, which is the motherboard that's sort of centrally located. Uh, that motherboard's got um, an SSD below, which has also got ROS set up and Ross is set up to interact with the connect at the very top. So it's basically, in the current form, it's sort of two robots fused into one because the, the Ross and the connect will actually be able to, it can generate point clouds. So it can move the connect around and, and sense the depth of where things are away from it and generate the clouds so that it can actually start, you know, moving. Like you could put it on the ground and say, you know, go out to where the tables were for lunch and it would sort of get out of the room by itself without hitting anything. Uh, that, I think, in my opinion, is a huge differentiator between doing something with the BeagleBone and doing something with ROS and more, you know, more hardcore sort of robotics is if you're wanting to have a degree of autonomy and a degree of route planning and certainly perception because trying to um, service the, the connect with a BeagleBone is, I don't think it would actually work because it, the connect can saturate a USB 2 bus with image data. So the BeagleBone just is not going to be able to keep up unless you have an FPGA at that end or something like that to, to be able to take in the massive amount of data that's coming at you. Um, the slides for Terry basically because it's sort of sitting there and people are well back. You're welcome to come up and have a look at him afterwards. Um, but I thought I'd take some close up shots of certain areas. Uh, this is a major differentiator between it and Tiny Tim. Uh, the, this is a motor that actually runs the wheel and there's an 8 to 1 uh, ratio between the, the brass gear and the alloy gear and this is a um, quadratic encoder um, so that will actually detect a thousand clicks per revolution and with the 8 to 1 multiplier there's quite a number, quite a level of precision when the wheel is turning as to getting feedback as to where the wheel is because it's all well and good to sort of supply power to a wheel and then say I've gone a meter but unless you actually get that other feedback there telling you that you haven't actually gone a meter, you've gone, you know, 45 centimetres because the weight of the thing or the slope or the carpet was a little bit higher in friction. So to actually do robotics where the robot knows where it is, knows where it's going and can predictably move, you sort of need to have a, a similar setup to having, basically having feedback to something that you're doing. 
the two front wheels are controlled by this little board, which is a microcontroller again. Um, the, the wires at the top here are from the quad encoders and it's accessed again over a um, TTL serial interface. Um, and the, that motor, that board does um, PID control, which is again, um, when you're setting a goal, uh, you have a position where you are in a goal and the PID is basically a way of moving the position where you are from the feedback to getting it cl as close to the goal as you possibly can. Um, and depending on what your PID constants are in the algorithm, you can sort of have it, you know, if your P is really large and there's no I or D, it'll overshoot and then you can actually get hunting to try and get to where you want to go. Um, trying to think of what the, uh, what the big, uh, Yes, um, basically to write to the, uh, the serial interface you need to have, it's a serial packet interface which I've seen on a few robotics things where instead of just saying, you know, um, these four bytes define the command and how far they go, it also wants to tag a, a check some of the four bytes on the end and have some sort of framing. So you're in a lot of ways reinventing doing sort of IP over, over serial. This is probably completely illegible for people at the back of the room. Um, the main thing with this was somewhere or other. Um, the uh, right you went 32s and things like that, which um, I find to be great if you're doing BeagleBone uh, driven robotics because you're often dealing with 16 32 bit integers over the wire. And unless you have the actual buffer class for interacting with hardware makes this a lot easier because if you know you're talking large or small Indian and you know if you're talking 16 or 32 bits, you can just send the, the numbers into a buffer and then send them over the wire and you don't have to play around with bit shifting and writing all of those functions yourself. Um, the server side, uh, this comes from the, uh, the feedback. So the number, the number of pulses per, uh, per rotation for each feedback motor. So when on the interface, I have a, a web interface for controlling Terry and telling him, you know, move, move one unit forward. Um, I'd like you to do a, a figure eight, or I'd like you to do like a, you know, a, a donut shape and then come back to where you were and stop. Um, and in this case, again, it's all uh, web sockets based. And when the magic turn web socket command is given, um, it will then issue a, um, a PID command to the microcontroller that's controlling the wheels and that'll tell, then control with PID the movement to the desired destination at the velocity and acceleration that you've chosen. Um, the display I got for about 20 or 25 bucks from SparkFun. This is another little fun part about robotics is that uh, everything you do, there's multiple ways of doing it and a lot of it comes down to your budget. Um, you know, I could strengthen up Terry by adding sort of $50 worth of more aluminium to him so that he's not as flimsy um, and wouldn't shake around quite as much. But, you know, it's whether or not I spend that on that or whether I invested on, you know, putting a connect on there, for example, which the choice has been made. Um, so the display itself, you have to, in behind the display is a 328, which is hardwired to the display because you have to keep pulsing the display to get the colors. So you can't really sort of say, you know, here is an RGB value, I'd like that pixel to be that RGB value. You have to set time splicing and actually, you know, turn it on a certain amount of time and turn it off a certain amount of time to generate your perceived color. So having a microcontroller that's just sitting there thrashing its guts out and doing that for you is incredibly handy. and that microcontroller is then talked to by the BeagleBone Black saying basically it's a remote frame buffer protocol. The BeagleBone Black generates a frame buffer in the right pixel format and just keeps pumping them down at 20 frames a second to the microcontroller directly into its RAM buffer. And it doesn't so much matter if you're, you know, writing somewhere where it's trying to, the microcontroller is trying to read from that area because, you know, basically the pixel just changes colour. So there's no great ramification or, you know, syncing needed there. Uh, on the BeagleBone Black, uh, you can turn around then and do more advanced things. Uh, if you're generating this frame buffer, 
you can say I'd like to use Pango and I'd like to use Cairo, which for a screen of that size is massive overkill. But if you want to have an uh, anti alias font output, so you grab a Google web font or something like that and you say, you've got an 8 by 32 or you've got a 32 by 16 screen and then you can generate anti alias output uh, with your open type, uh, open type rendering on the, uh, the beagle bone and get actually decent text rather than the sort of snappy text that all the buses and everything else have with no AA and uh, no font choice, which is uh, not so good. Uh, I think the gist of this, apart from the uh, canvas to pixels, the interesting function is not actually on that screen. And the interesting function is really tiny, which is unfortunate. Um, this block of code here is essentially just taking uh, the pixels, the pixels that are coming from Cairo, and that's generating an into the frame buffer format that is being expected at the other end. And then SP screen right will actually transfer the massaged frame buffer over onto the microcontroller. So yes, from a software point of view, one would think that adding another level of indirection, another pointer can sort of always help, you know, yet another pointer always helps solve the problem. And in hardware, I found that yet another 328 sort of does the same thing. Uh, my drawer, which what was the interesting thing? Basically what I was saying before, um, being able to select the font of your choice, um, the size of the font, and then actually grabbing proper layout with bounding box ascents and things like that. Um, so you can do whatever level of complicated rendering you want with nice, um, nice fonts and a reasonable sort of API that Cairo provides, and then just keep uh, outputting that to whatever physical display you've got. Um, for pan and tilt, uh, the very top part, which is on the next slide rather than me highlighting it. So the pan part, I've decided to use a gear motor and a, a dual H bridge, like an L298, which are less than $5. Um, the main downside to this, and just off the top of the photo, there's a brass gear. Um, and again, it's sort of the difference between using direct gear motors like that and using servos, because the servo has a, a small a uh, small electric motor and a potentiometer for feedback and you sort of say, you know, sit at 90 degrees and it turns the motor, reads the potentiometer and it tries to get to that position you've set. And unfortunately, unless you're using open servo or something, you'd never get to see whether it's actually, you know, made it to that position. So that was my plan here, was to have the gear motor there, have the motor controller and then place feedback in the way of a potentiometer with another gear so I could actually make my own servo in the large format. <coughs> Um, or use an IC which uses a Hall effect. So you get a, a rotation of the shaft, a magnet on the end of the shaft and the IC below. And the IC can then tell you in extremely fine position, precision where that uh, axle is sitting. Um, that's probably what I'm going to do now because I've found the, and you get by large precision, I'm talking 12 or 14 bits of precision for one rotation. So you would know exactly where it was. And the good part about doing this rather than just using a servo is that that information can make, it, make its way back to the beagle mine so it can know exactly where the camera is all the time rather than saying, and by know what it, where it is and know where it is physically rather than know where you're telling it to go because something might have stopped it. If the robot's going up a hill, the hill's gonna actually try and, the gravity's gonna stop that and if the motor's not strong enough, then it won't know whether it's physically looking at something or whether it's looking 10 degrees off because of gravity. But yes, with the feedback, it will actually know. It'll know exactly where it is physically, and it'll know I'm, oh, has it died? Don't die. Do we need to replug it, or? Ah, oh, yes, we're back. Excellent. Oh, magic. <laughs> and you got to harvest your phone. It's all good. So the alternative is this, which is for the tilt. Um, so you have a, a large servo with metal gearing, etc., and it'll have a potentiometer in here to work out the feedback of where it is. And if that's hooked up again to a torque multiplier, um, whatever the actual torque of your servo is, in this case, I think it's somewhere between five and eight times. That's the amount of torque you're actually gonna get off the large gear. Um, which if you're looking to do things in reality, the uh, torque you're getting at the actual axle the amount of force that that can generate uh, diminishes the further away the load is. So in this case, 
I've sort of done a, a moderately bad thing by having the, the axle here and then I've placed the load four inches away from the axle. So I've got a torque multiplier with the gear and then I've got a torque diminisher by the fact that the actual weight of the connector is a fair distance away from the axle. But again, you know, if I put that into a trough and build a better tilt unit, then that'll work better. And the good part is that even with the weight of the connect, that can hold, that servo can hold it, um, say about 20 degrees either way. So given that the connect, you need to be about a meter away in order to get sort of decent data, because they're not meant for people to have them like right in front of them when they're playing games. Um, that should actually work quite well for it working out where obstacles are that it might hit with its wheels or any other part of the, the chassis itself. Yeah, well, I was thinking too, just having the, um, a shaft in the middle with springs, just to take some of the load off the, um, you know, basically to drop the gravity load when it moved down and let the servo actually bring it back again. Um, what was interesting in the pan and tilt code? Nothing on that screen particularly jumping out. So I did have more slides than I needed to have. Excellent. And this is very much the same. I had gear motor set wheel direction. And Alrighty, talking IMUs, this was some area that I definitely wanted to get to, so I thought skipping over the gear motor control was not a bad idea. Um, IMUs are a wonderful thing and you can get them in, for these sorts of things for like uh, five or ten dollars depending on the precision uh, that you're wanting. So the IMU, you get an accelerator, you get the ability to t tell how quickly you're rotating and uh, basically a digital compass. Um, a lot of these things are used in the, the quadcopters. Um, and there's a interesting difference. I've written code to get the, um, get the compass bearing uh, off Arduino and off the BeagleBone Black. So it's sort of a, a subtle and interesting difference between how to interact over I2C or the TWI on both platforms. And I think, yes, the next slide, which is almost too small. Um, in this case, uh, you're writing the actual register that you want to read, and I don't know, you're, reading, you're giving it the, the register address in yellow there of where you want to read, and the I2C bus, the actual self-wire, in this case, remembers the um, I2C address of the chip, because every chip on the I2C bus can have its, well, should have its own address so that you don't have clashes. Uh, whereas on Arduino you don't do that, you first select the address of the chip, you write the address that you'd like to read, you deselect the chip and then you actually select the chip and start reading. So you have to do an independent write first giving the address on that I2C chip that you'd like to read from and then just selecting the chip and starting to read from it. Whereas in this case you're actually passing the address, rather the address on the chip that you'd like to read from rather than the address of the chip itself in the top line. And I have the declination angle so that it can actually work out relative to Brisbane, the proper uh, compass headings. And this is the contrasting code with Arduino where you're basically giving it the address here, you, the address of the I2C chip, the address on that I2C chip that you'd like to read, and then when you're starting to perform the read, you give it the address of the chip and how many bytes you'd like to read. So if you're coming from one way or the other way, there's sort of little gotchas where you're sort of passing the address of the chip there and then it's sort of nothing good is coming and uh, you really should pass the address on the chip rather than the actual chip itself at times. So it's a, a subtle difference in the API between Arduino and BeagleBone. But again, they're fun little things that you don't really find until you try and port the Arduino code that you know works to a BeagleBone Black and you're sort of wondering, you know, I'm telling it the right address but I'm not getting data. And then you find that this is why and the documentation doesn't and many times sort of jump out and say this is why. So as far as perception goes on the BeagleBone, at the very front I have a, a servo mounted facing upwards and a little infrared sensor. So it sends a small beam out and the other eye uh, catches the beam coming back. 
and you can normally sample about um, 30 to 60 times a um, yeah, 30 to 60 times a second or somewhere in that range. The downside is that you're basically just getting a single point. So in that case, you know, if it moves and there's a chair leg between where the servo is jumping, the chair leg can quite happily be there and not be detected. Which, you know, yes, the beagle bone has enough power to actually move that and read that. And uh, when I switch it on, um, you'll see not only the compass heading on screen, but also uh, the positional data of objects that are being detected at the very bottom is a immediate feedback of of this particular perception thing. But this was the point where I decided that I needed to connect and I needed to put a proper computer on there um, and then I needed to run ROS so that I could do proper full-scale perception. Um, batteries are a lot of fun. Um, the rechargeable AA seems to be quite useful. Um, I've got uh, four batteries now on the Terry robot, um, a bank of eight double A's to run these batteries and run the pan tilt, whole pan tilt operation, the actual current draw for that. Three batteries to run the screen and three to eight that's actually driving the screen. Um, and a little lithium battery with a five volt up step uh, which runs the Beagle Bone and runs the uh, smaller webcam which is a, seven, a 720 webcam at the top the webcam that's actually below the connect, um, a USB hub, and uh, at the back, which probably hasn't actually been mentioned and probably can't be seen um, by many people, is a TP-Link. Ah, it's on the move. A little um, access point which you can run OpenWRT on. So that's actually run off this green battery that you see. And then you have the new and improved large external laptop battery, um, which is going to be running, uh, it runs quite happily, runs the um, J900 quad core Atom uh, machine and the SSD. So this, this particular combination has been, has worked well and doesn't really work that well if you want to have high-end perception. But if you want to have direct control or direct drive robot, which is currently what Terry is, when that I can say, I'd like you to move one meter forward and it will take that command and make it happen. Um, the, these two, uh, as you, the core of your robot are a great, great choice. Um, but if you want to actually have it, have, be able to tell it, you know, go to the fridge and get me a beer and come back with it, um, you need to have greater perception. So you need to have a, a motherboard. Well, you don't need to have, but it, was a, it seems like an easier choice to have a motherboard um, and a connect and be able to do route planning. Uh, webcam over Wi-Fi, um, because again, if you've got a webcam even at 720 and you're trying to do 30 frames a second uh, on a one gigahertz ARM chip, that's not going to work out incredibly well if you're doing any, any sort of image processing on it. So at the moment, I can view from the laptop the uh, Logitech webcam, and it's just turned into a motion JPEG on the BeagleBone, which it can quite happily keep up processing and then send that over the TP-Link wireless access point. And this is currently the, uh, the fun and joy. I had tried to have the Kinect running off a quad core 2 gig arm instead of actually having an Intel Atom machine, but getting the Kinect to run through all of the layers and through ROS um, is a challenge on an arm machine. I don't think it's impossible, but I spent like an entire evening trying to get it to happen and didn't get anywhere and thought I'll just put a $100, arm, um, $100 Atom uh, board on there and now it actually works. Yeah, interesting stuff about APIs. This was something I saw reading data sheets to SPI, um, was the suspend. Um, and I found it when I was making that audio player because I thought, this is great, you've got one SPI bus, you've got a micro SD card on the SPI bus, you've got a DSP decoder chip on the SPI bus, you can sort of select the SD card, read like, you know, 512 bytes deselect it, select the DSP and actually write the data to it. But then I thought I'll have a display driver that's SPI as well. And then you'll notice that when the DSP sends you an interrupt saying I'm oh, start for data and you're actually writing something to the display, you need to be able to drop the current or suspend the current SPI transaction. 
service the interrupt and then resume the SPI transaction. Some chips will allow you to do this with a suspend line on SPI and some won't. Uh, but it's certainly, it's one of those things that I thought the Arduino API should possibly be able to, to handle, but there doesn't seem to be any great explicit support for a, you know, suspend, suspend current transaction because I'm in an interrupt handler. Possibly because if you're doing that, you should use a, a 1284 or a more advanced microchip with multiple SPI buses, but um, it's certainly something to look out for if you're programming SPI. Yeah, I do that on the um, audio player, um, but suspend would have been so much nicer. Um, so this is basically what's on the motherboard now and the rationale that are behind why I'm looking to go and am going ROS is um, mainly the very bottom one, reuse of existing code, um, but there's a whole bunch of support in there for uh, transformations. So you can say relative to the very base of Terry, um, you know, the pan tilt unit is half a metre above uh, and then the connect is this far above and actually define your uh, translation matrices between things and then tell, for example, a robot arm, you know, I'd like you to pick up a ball that is half a metre away at this angle and all of the transformations to actually make the servos actuate and grab the ball off the ground and pick it up are done because it knows, ROS itself uh, knows and you've defined the, um, the translations required to get to each individual point and then the gripper so that it knows how to actually translate your command into a real world um, set of uh, servo commands. Um, and it's also network friendly so that on that I can view the point cloud off that motherboard on the laptop and all of this sort of thing. Uh, but mainly uh, perception and route planning are something that I can't see being able to do on a bigger bone black that the, is able to be done once you have 8 gig of RAM and even the, um, the quad core Atom chip, even though it's not that slow, um, without GPU assistance there, if I'm generating a point cloud with the connect, I'm getting about one frame a second if it's a fairly complicated scene because there's a lot of, um, a lot of image processing that has to be done to try and work out um, overlays and various points in the structure that are in the image. So I'm actually looking to possibly put a, a GPU or try and get the the Intel GPU that's on that board into the, into the mix there. Um, so the future directions, I've written a H24 HMAC um, class and I have the various ICs that can do HMAC um, because the radio link between things um, I'd like to actually have authenticated and I don't really care if people snoop on the fact that my joystick is at full because you can see the robot moving at full anyway. But I would really like for no one else to come into the room with a RF24 chip and say, hey, I'd like to hijack your robot and take it away now. So unless they happen to be able to generate the same HMAC, then uh, in which case I'd really like to have a chat with them anyway. Um, more expensive gear, definitely LiDAR. Um, again, it comes down to a triage thing. LiDAR is about to get low end ones from China, about $400. So your, the cost of the the Terry robot you see before you is probably somewhere in the range of $1,000. Uh, so it can get quite expensive depending on, uh, on what, what sort of gear you buy, you're buying. Um, bang for your buck though, a small motherboard and a Kinect is a lot of, a lot of fun. And uh, yes, full autonomy for Terry would be nice. I don't think I'll get to full, but uh, partial autonomy. Um, and profit would be a, an interesting goal. <laughs> But I think that the you know, Silicon Valley startups sort of decided that profit may be a great goal and many of the companies are, uh, haven't found that, so I'm, I'm in good company. <laughs> Alrighty, and at the very bottom, which may or may not be legible, depending where you are in the room, I've listed some of the Google web fonts that I've used. And they're actually available on Blogger and things like that as well, but you can't easily get to them. So they are available, and if you go through advanced settings, you can get the fonts that Google have freely available. So that was enough on that little sidetrack. Um, questions, criticisms, people who want to see these robots moving around? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy may actually work on the desk. This is what you do when you want to make a joystick and you don't want to pay a lot of money. You have a $4 joystick from China, you have a $9 Uno clone radio chip there and basically just sold the headers directly on. Uh, 
Ah, excellent. So I've made the uh, two LEDs respond. Basically red is when that side wheel is not moving at all, and yellow or purple is full, spe full steam ahead. And on the very fascia, alternating between smiley face and various other text, is a $5, um, $5 OLED chip, uh, OLED screen, which is a fairly low resolution, but um, again, it's one of those things that for $5, it doesn't really matter if it's monochrome and low resolution. Uh, inside the small gearbox, the small plastic motor holders, as soon as you release this, it goes into hard brake. So even if it was going at a fair volume, fair speed, it would, uh, the motors would work against the speed and stop it. So the two plastic things inside, I've just used the low-tech super glue, a small micro gear motor inside um, and bolted those to aluminium frames, aluminium channel running down the, the core and a small um, roller wheel at the back to allow the uh, the back of the robot to follow the front and four double A's in a, um, a container. The bulk of the actual controller of this is running at 3.3 volts. Um, the higher voltage is given to the motor controller which is running the full full battery pack voltage is running to the gear motors that run the wheels but everything else is 3.3 volts. So now, if I fire up the beast, uh, famous last words. There we go. Yay. It's one good thing they did with the Burglebone, putting the LEDs to be sort of blindingly bright. Okay, it's running because the front server is actually doing its thing. Unfortunately, the access point has decided not to come up, which is not great. It's a silo. Yes. <laughs> Steady on. battery out and see whether that was the problem. <coughs> Excellent. Um, yeah, it should it should come on now. Whether the access point actually decides to come up is another thing. Ah, yes, we have light. Excellent. I suspect that running the uh, entire operation off that one um, 3.7 volt lithium battery is not. Uh, access point. Excellent.
Ah, I have control. Excellent. So the tilting mechanism is probably unseeable from. Uh, Notice the small little tilts. So in theory, the screen's now showing that he's facing west, and this Knight Rider, like wonderful thing at the bottom, is coming from the uh, the infrared sensor at the uh, at the base. So if I do that, it'll show red dots, which is uh, color coded as to how far away the object is. And every time it does a complete sweep, it moves everything up. So you get three lines of history as to where the, uh, the obstacles are that it's seen. Um, other than that, if I try and drive him there, it's not going to end well. <laughs> I think eventually it will become heavy enough that if it goes off the edge of a table, it'll just go through the floor. <laughs> should work nicely. Uh-huh, that's why. Let's do that to turn that off. <coughs> yeah, I'm on. Oops. Okay. I would say that one of the cables has come a bit loose. Just great stuff. Um, well, yeah, the actual motion, I'm going to have to run over its cables. For this very reason, the current one that I'm building, which has omni wheels um, and four stepper motors, so it can actually strafe and move in all directions and rotate on the spot, um, I've hard soldered all of the things so that none of the actual point-to-point -point connections can come loose. I had this this morning, um, and unfortunately I didn't sort of, I had that gleamy sort of, oh, it'll all just work when I got here, but obviously in the car, uh, something has uh, decided to 
make my demo fun. So anyway, um, I'll have him moving around at some point later on, and uh, <laughs> probably in like 10 minutes or five minutes after I've been here, but. Um, yeah, I looked at how, uh, well, yes, I'm using PCL at the moment for the point clouds, and I looked at the Octomap stuff and how the actual library was written, and it was refreshing. Basically, I thought if I was going to write my own Octomap, um, everything that they'd written was exactly how I would write it, so it was one of those things where I didn't have to think, oh, I'll try and write yet another one. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Ross has a lot of interfaces to this and to um, the image processing libraries and things like that, so a lot of the libraries that you would want to use if you're trying to put together a robot yourself is there's interfaces in ROS anyway. So it just seemed like a fun thing to actually take advantage of ROS. Uh, yeah. I've never done any robotics or software programs for robotics, but is it, is it normal to say like tests to test the fact that everything is working or um, I do I did Previously with this I ran into the issue where the motors weren't working and I thought, why is that? And I have feedback on the web interface as to the current voltage of the batteries right. and how many amps each motor is right. using, um, which at the moment is not coming through at all. So um, I would say yes, uh, I see, I see. but you know, it's one of those things. If it was a commercial application, then I'd certainly have you know, fallbacks and tests and you know, a panel of LEDs that would show you know, bad things have happened, you've moved this in a car and it hasn't sustained it. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I think the magic smoke detector is usually, oh, why does it tingle? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I'm worried about the stepper motor thing, because that's going to use 15 amps. Right. So it's not going to tingle, it's going to, uh, it's going to bite. Yeah. There's a question. Uh, yeah. Yep. And I know the Connect has an idea of things ahead of it, but I mean, obviously they're quite well separated. Mm -hmm. uh, if there were, uh, like, a, say, a bike group or something that it was to potentially approach, would it, could it, I don't know, uh, behead itself, so to speak? Um, well, this is sort of why I've got the Connect on the pan tilt, and why what I was saying with Ross with the transformation matrices, because Ross would, you would tell Ross exactly where the pan and tilt was and where the Connect was. So relative to a ground plate, which would be like, you know, where your front wheels were, it would know that the connect was 50 centimetres back and, you know, 120 centimetres above. And when you panned and tilt or when you rotated it exactly where it was going. Okay. So that's, that's the good part that basically that all gets put together for you if you, you do that. But if you do, at the moment, the actual IR thing has no idea. Like it doesn't know that it's, you know, 20 centimetres over the ground. Yeah. It just knows, oh, I've seen something. And here is an analogue reading saying that, you know, somewhere between half a volt and two volts is how far away it is. Which so, so you're just beginning to experiment with the ROS stuff now? Right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, I have the Connect set up to do point cloud stuff. And the motherboard's on there, but since the talk was for like, you know, using the BeagleBone Black, I thought there was no real point in hooking so, the motherboard so what's up. what's your next aim for, for an arm that can like, you know, pick up the ball or something? Um, yeah, I have the robot arm I was going to put on a, um, a threaded rod at the back because basically the whole back of that robot is fairly clear. So I put a threaded rod there and the arm plate itself could move down and actually pick something up off the ground and put it on the table. Right. So this would be great. Like, you know, again, a useful thing. You could sort of say to the robot, you know, that thing is on the ground. Well, there's that. But, you know, for things like, you know, mum may not want to actually, you know, lean right down to pick something up. So it has, it actually moves into the horrible land of having application. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, yeah, possibly. <laughs> Depending on how many people want to have this gigantic, well-lit hunk of metal moving around to pick objects up, but you know. Maybe for 
if there's a scare off that dog out the front of the house option or something, you know. Chase cats. Yeah. <laughs> Release the taser. Yeah, what yep. kind of uh, extra information do you get from the Kinect that you don't get from a uh, normal webcam? Um, the depth information is the big thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, Um, the answer is both. Uh, it has a whole bunch of uh, ICs in the actual Connect, but um, depending if you're running with Microsoft OS and you're sort of you know using their SDK and stuff, then yes. If you're not, then um, there is code around in the OpenNI and the libraries like that, so you can you know, wait, shake your hand like that, and it'll detect where your palm is, and the software will then give you um, three-dimensional coordinates as you move your hand around. So you can do, depending on what the object is you're detecting, um, if you're trying to detect whether something is a can of soup or a, a can of Coke, um, you're sort of on your own. But if you want to see whether there's actually a cylindrical object that's a meter away from you, um, you should be able to, to do that fairly, I wouldn't say easily, but you should be able to do that with a Kinect. So the big, the big difference is with the, because it's using infrared to give you the depth info and the little infrared sensor I've got at the front, you're getting one point reading you know, 50 times a second from that. And with the Connect, you're getting 30 blankets of depth information every second. So you're just getting so much more information. Um, and you know, even though you might only be able to process things at like you know, one frame a second with your, um, your, to, to make your point cloud, um, that's really a matter of the fact that the motherboard is not up to, to the amount of information that's on offer. Thank you.